Hey, what's up? My name is Mike, and in this video, we're reviewing the Galaxy Z Fold 4. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, this is a video about the MetaQuest Pro. This thing is an absolute unit. Obviously, a lot larger than the previous ones, but way, way better in a lot of aspects. We have color pass-through. You can see your room, you can walk around, and it does a pretty decent job. We have a redesign on the headset that gives you a more balanced approach with the battery in the back. It's bigger, but way more comfortable. And we have redesigned controllers as well with dual motors in them and a lot of other really cool features like expression tracking, the ability to have like multiple monitors for your laptop while still seeing in color the surrounding room and other things like that. So a ton to talk about in this video. So this is the MetaQuest Pro. I've been excited to get my hands on this for a pretty long time. Let's dive into it. So there's a lot to talk about here. The MetaQuest Pro is no cheap device, like right off the bat. This is selling at $1,500 at the time of launch, but there's still a lot of interesting stuff here. So first of all, you might say, why would they make it so expensive? The previous ones were like one fifth that cost. And the reason is kind of in line with why it's so different, why the features are so different. And that's because it's meant for a kind of a different crowd, which is not to say it's not going to be fantastic for playing games or, or for watching media, but this is really being marketed by Meta as a device for enterprises, for businesses, for creators. I wanna talk about two different perspectives, the consumer side, watching media, playing games, things like that. And from the professional side, uh, because I do have experience in a lot of the categories that they're really talking about here. From engineering, I worked as a mechanical engineer for a long time, and also from the creative side, because I mean, I do a lot of graphic design work, I make videos, things like that. And so in that entire space, I have a pretty good grasp of what kind of professionals would probably want to use these and what they would really like to have out of this. So let's start off with the controller. These are, first of all, really ergonomic. Like I have fairly large hands and, and holding this for me feels completely comfortable. Uh, my wife used it, said it was also extremely comfortable. It seems that this is a good design for a lot of different hand sizes out there. You can see that we have our three buttons on the, on, the, on the top or the front, as well as a little joystick. It feels really comfortable to use. And we have three sensors that are visible from the outside, two on the front, one on the top. And from my experience using it with the headset, it is incredibly accurate. You can really see like where your hand is and, and it feels like in every app that I've used this with, I had absolutely no issues. It was working really perfectly. The triggers on here are supposed to be more force sensitive where we have the ability to not just detect when it's squeezed, but also to what to, to what extent it's squeezed. On the inside, you can see that we do have our little uh, nodes right there for charging because these do magnetically stick together and they set on the charging dock, as you can see right there. Uh, and the charging dock also houses the headset as well, which you set right on top of the others. So the eye tracking and expression tracking is really pretty crazy. So you can see like my avatar here, if I look one way, it'll show my eyes looking that way, which is really cool. In addition to that, if I make like any kind of movement with my mouth, it imitates it like really well, like not just like you'd expect an avatar, but surprisingly better than I thought. In addition, although obviously like the controllers do like obviously what your hands do, but if you don't use the controllers, you can also just use your hands. And I think that like is not quite as convenient, but feels a lot more natural. So you can see like your hands and, and it does a good job of showing like I was really navigating well through a lot of the interface using just my hands and not using the controllers. But the one weird thing is that they're still not able to like track your elbow. So if I have my hands here, I could have my elbow in like different orientations, but it still shows my arm in the same orientation. So that's kind of awkward if my arm's here and it shows it up there. Again, something that's going to be improved in future iterations, but nonetheless, like what's going on right now is really impressive. And I think this is a big improvement here as well. The controllers have two different motors. They have one down in the base and they have one on the end to give you haptics in two different places on each controller. Now looking, one more thing I wanna point out with the controller here that is actually really uh, interesting is that, well, besides that, the strap, I think it's just okay. It feels like for the price for $1,500, I would expect a slightly more premium feeling strap. Whatever, it's a strap, it gets the job done. But if you twist it, you're actually able to pull it out and replace that with a stylus tip. Now the stylus tip at first feels like it's going to fall out, but you're not like shaking it a lot. So it seems to not really fall out, but, but still, it's nice that you have that in there because it's really meant to be something more for the creatives is what, their idea, what the idea is, where you can turn it backwards and use it for drawing and 3D drawing and things like that with the headset on. And this is where I said that I used to work as a mechanical engineer. And so I can see kind of what they're going for with this, but at the same time, it might not be 
as widely adopted as you think there, where like the, the general doodles and like, oh, I'm drawing a car, like, yeah, maybe a couple people at a company like Ford would actually do that. But I would argue that a huge, huge majority of engineers would probably use this more so to just demonstrate the model they already made on a laptop or a desktop. Because most of the design work that actually happens in a product is not like sketching in like artistic design. Most of the actual uh, man hours spent on there are calculating tolerances, calculating how much flex an individual snap needs, exactly what the dimensions are, you're extruding things, uh, adding different features on there and a lot of that is a lot more number based as opposed to like flowy hand drawing uh, kind of based but still cool idea you can use a stylus for something more artistic if you're looking to do that or just for general like like I said, if you have a design that was already made and you want to present that to somebody, maybe they can just use the drawing and say like, oh, let's extrude this out a little further and you can like see it in 3D space. That's where I see that that could be really useful. I'm getting a little bit off track. Let's talk about the headset now. Like I said, this is a big redesign from the previous Quest devices because now we actually have the battery in the back, which although it is like it's a larger battery and it looks like a much larger headset, it actually does feel more balanced now, so you have weight on the back and the front. You have a massive cushion on the back as well, and it does flex outward when you put it on, although it is kind of like a rigid plastic thing. So there's obviously some springs back here or some kind of uh, elastic in there as well, and we have a wheel that can actually adjust how far in that is. I don't know. Yeah, you can kind of see that on camera. Then on the side, we have these silicone magnetic light blockers that really do a good job of blocking out a glare that you'd otherwise have from a window or, or any light that's like kind of at eye level around you. I find that the lenses, if you're not using these, really reflect a lot of light into your eyes. And so these little blinders really help a lot with that. But if you don't have a lot of light in the room, you can take these off and it doesn't really change much. Or if you're using the pass-through mode, like I said, where you want to see everything around you, taking these off can make it feel a little bit better. So you kind of see in your peripherals a little bit of your surroundings. You can also manually slide these lenses back and forth to any position you want. Uh, and I believe it goes from 55 to 75 IPD, so enter uh, pupillary distance. And so, again, manual adjustments there, but it doesn't lock you into a specific, like, one through three or something like that. We also have a wheel in the front. This is my first real complaint here. The wheel is for adjusting how close the lens is to your eyes, but they don't have any kind of notches on there, and it feels like when you're wearing it, it's not, like, the easiest wheel to turn. Other than that, we don't have really a lot of adjustments I need to mention here. We've got a, a power on the left side, volume on the right. The speakers really do a fantastic job and, and deliver a surprising amount of bass on here. Of course, we have the two little ports on the front as well as a USB Type-C on the left side. And, of course, we have a lot of lenses on here. We've got different cameras on all angles, and so that's going to be what's used for your surroundings as well as for that pass-through mode, which is in color, which kind of leads me into talking about the experience with this headset. So talking about the full color pass-through, I'm really happy that we have that. It's a big step up from previous generations, but don't expect it to look anything like actual reality. Instead, it looks a lot more like you're watching a video filmed through two flip phones, is kind of how I could explain it, where you have like some bands of black and white, you have a lot of grain everywhere, even in bright, uh, well-lit rooms, and it's really kind of glitchy sometimes. Like I said, it, it's much better than previous generations, like I'm glad we have it in color, but it's still, for $1,500, it, it doesn't look that convincing. Uh, so for example, if you look at like anything, you look at like a window, for example, something that has straight lines, they like wiggle and jump all over the place. They don't look like normal straight lines. And so I think that's kind of like a weird thing that's a little bit of a turnoff there. I usually leave that off as much as possible. I, I try not to use the pass-through mode just because it does make me feel a little bit weird. I like having the full immersed VR because that is a much sharper image, which leads me into the displays on here. Some people were concerned because they thought, you know, the resolution should be 4K. It's only like 1800 by 1920. But the truth is, when you're using these, they are pretty decent. You're able to read text just fine. Uh, just fine. I don't find that anything on the edges is blurry because the redesigned lens does a really good job of showing you everything like really well in focus. So you can see everything around you. It's 90 hertz. You can read things just fine, but if you look really closely, if you're like really looking for it, you can see the pixels. The displays have a 40% higher pixel density and 75% better contrast. Like I said, when you look at the numbers here, like the resolution might be technically lower, but the, the pixel density is higher and the, the lenses really have a lot to do with that. Okay, so this is kind of funny. We, we still obviously have like the room boundaries, so like you put these on, you draw your room boundary, great, but 
for some reason, we still don't have like a, any kind of vertical room boundary. So if you have like a ceiling fan or if you have something that's not like at full height, uh, it is not unlikely that you'd hit that. Like I was playing basketball in here and just like punched the crap out of my ceiling because I just got, I got, I don't know, I got two in it. I was, I was, I was trying to make some threes and I was jumping and like I just punched the crap out of the ceiling. Additionally, the other thing that people are, are pretty excited about with this is the opportunity to have like a full color pass through around you, but also work on multiple virtual desktop uh, displays. So if you have your laptop there and you have like four displays up, that could be really, really cool. But the question is how well can you read the text? Obviously, if it's really fine print, it's not nearly the resolution of like a MacBook Pro sitting right in front of you, but you are able to read the text pretty well. And in all honesty, I'm going to be testing this a lot more. I will be making a future video focused exclusively on that feature. If you wanna see that, be sure to subscribe. But of course, this is not without its downsides. As I mentioned, the first one and by far the biggest one for some people, is the price. $1,500 is a lot of money for this. I know it's meant for enterprises and that's where the money is not really as big of a deal. But I mean, if you step back and look at this objectively, this is substantially more expensive than the other meta devices. And you do have a lot of new things on here, but there are still quite a few things that I, I wish were better. Like for $1,500, I feel like the pass-through mode should be a little bit better than it is. Additionally, for $1,500, I wish we had a longer battery life. That's really the next big drawback here is that you're getting about two-ish hours, depending on what you're doing, like face tracking on, uh, pass through on, or screen recording, all these different things can affect the battery life, but you're getting on the order of about two hours of battery life. And if you expect somebody to like really work throughout the entire day with this, that's just really not feasible. But I could see this being something that you just leave on a charging stand. And when you wanna get into a meeting, maybe once a day, you could put this on, get into virtual meeting with other people and show off like a 3D design or something like that. So this kind of leads me to an interesting conclusion. Starting off on the consumer side, this is still a fantastic device, but for $1,500, it's really out of range for most people and most people would be better off spending one fifth the price for a pretty similar experience. But if you have $1,500 because you won the lottery or made some really good investments or inherited money or whatever, if you have the money, it's still, it's a great device. Like it really is nice to have. But looking at the other side, if you are a business, there are some businesses that this is exactly what they're looking for. There are other businesses that might buy these and try to fit them in to make work more productive. But I think a lot of companies out there are probably gonna look at this and say, that's a cool idea. Next generation, when it actually gets better, when it gets cheaper and has a longer battery life, that's when we're going to buy it. So that's my opinion on this right now, but leave a comment and let me know what you think about the MetaQuest Pro. Super cool idea. I love how we are iterating and making some progress on this. And I'm super excited to see how the software adapts and, and where we end up next. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking and subscribing. I'm Mike O'Brien. See you next time.